Uh, maybe I get started. Good morning, everyone. Today, Professor, we have Professor Vega from Caltech uh, presenting at the Tersaki Seminar Series. Uh, professor Vega is an assistant professor of medical engineering in Division of Engineering and Applied Science at the California Institute of Technology. He received his PhD in chemical engineering at the University of California, San Diego in 2014 as a Jacobs Fellow and HHMI International Student Research Fellow. In 2014 to 2017, he was a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Sciences at the University of California, Berkeley. He's a recipient of many awards, including Sloan Research Fellowship, IEEE EMBS Early Career Achievement Award, IEEE Sensor Council Technical Achievement Award, 3M Non-Tenured Faculty Award, MIT Tech Review, 35 Innovators Under 35, and ACS DIC Young Investigator Award. He's a World Economic Forum Young Scientist, class of 2020, a member of Global Young Academy, class of 2019, and 2020 highly cited researcher. He's an associate editor of Science Advances. His research interests include wearable devices, biosensors, flexible electronics, micro nanorobotics, and nanomedicine. Uh, uh, floor is yours, Way. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mehmet, for the introduction and invitation. Thanks, Ali, as well for the opportunity. And it's wonderful to be here virtually today to share our research on uh, skin interface and wearable biosensors. Uh, and we go right now assistant professor of medical engineering at Caltech. So I joined Caltech roughly four years ago. Uh, this is my lab. Uh, we have roughly 20 researchers, 10 postdocs, 10 PhD students, and some undergrads. And we are mainly developing bioelectronic devices for personalized and precision medicine. So we work on wearable biosensors, which is today's topic. We're also developing uh, micro nano robot for precision, uh, like a surgery and drug delivery. So here are some examples of our recent development. And with this, I will mainly discuss our primary research uh, area, wearable sensors. As we know, wearable technology can play a very important role in personalized healthcare because it can continuously collect data from our body. Um, I continue and non-invasive, and continuously collect data from our body and tell us what's going on and what's going wrong with our uh, health. But if you look at commercially available health monitors like an Apple Watch or Fitbit, so they can mainly track the physical activities or vital signs, but it can also provide more useful information about our health at molecule level. So we think a major gap, which is also a great opportunity in this field of wearable biosensor is how can we collect physiological information at molecule level and ideally non-invasive. So with this uh, regard, we are looking at mainly human sweat. As we know, sweat is a very important body fluid and we can retrieve sweat continuously, conveniently and non-invasively. And sweat contains many important biomarkers, including various electrons Electrolytes, metabolites, we can find over 30 amino acids and over 300 proteins from the skin. And we can also identify vitamins, uh, hormones, peptides, and of course, many substances such as drugs and heavy metals. So sweat test is not something new. Uh, we can collect sweat, analyze sweat, as you can imagine, potentially we can get a lot of information out of sweat. However, uh, you know, it's not well used in the past. Although it has per, uh, great promise for disease diagnosis, doping control, drug dosage control, genomic studies, and fitness monitoring. So one reason for sweat tests right now is broadly, not broadly used in a, uh, a clinical setting is because of how people do sweat tests in the past. So uh, usually people put a skin patch that they can collect sweat over time. Well, the sweat collection process usually takes several hours or even for days. Basically, then eventually they send this sample for laboratory analysis using mass spectrum to look at the biomarker level in human sweat. As you can imagine, this is a long-term average data. So we cannot get real-time information. And the sweat biomarker level actually changes rapidly over time. So that's why this is one of the major limitations in the past. Uh, I mean, right, that's one of the reasons why sweat test has a very limited application still. One, uh, you can, uh, as one can imagine, if we could uh, develop a wearable platform that can simultaneously quantify uh, these biomarkers from the skin uh, continuously, and we could uh, use this type of uh, data collected from the sensor for fitness tracking, for disease diagnosis, and very importantly, the large set of molecular data is not previously accessible. 
And if we couple this data collection with big data analysis and machine learning, uh, this will enable numerous fundamental clinical investigations. Uh, in 2016, uh, we published our first paper on sweat tests. So we basically proposed a fully integrated wearable sweat sensing platform that can perform in situ multiplex sweat analysis. This system can perform you know, real-time monitoring of metabolites, including glucose and lactate, electrolytes, including sodium and potassium. Uh, uh, this system can also monitor skin temperature for real-time sensor calibration. So overall, as you can see, this system is fully flexible. It contains a disposable sensor patch, which can be replaced easily. And uh, it contains also reusable electronic part. So the system can perform uh, in situ uh, signal processing and a wireless uh, transmission. Eventually we also develop a cell phone app. You can real time check the ana analyzer level from the phone. And uh, you can choose to upload the data to the cloud or send the data to the computer through email. So of course, uh, uh, this was done uh, while I was still a postdoc at Professor Ali Javi group. And there are many other groups uh, working in this field and who made significant progress in uh, sweat analysis. It's, uh, some examples including Professor Joseph Wong at UCSD, Professor Jason Hagenfield at uh, Cincinnati, and Professor Diane King at Seoul National, and Professor John Rogers at Northwestern University. Before I talk about applications, uh, our in general system, I want to briefly introduce some basic sensor design. Some of you may know this very well already, but some of you may not. So how we can detect molecule continuously using wearable system. So in case of sensing mechanism point of view, if we want to detect glucose, lactate, urea in many kinds of like metabolites, typically people use enzymatic electrodes. So basically we use a specific enzyme. If we want to detect glucose, let's say we use glucose oxidase. Lactate, we use lactate oxidase. This enzyme can catalyze the composition, decomposition of this molecule. This molecule can be oxidized, like glucose can be oxidized into glucosic acid and uh, generate hydrogen peroxide. People could detect hydrogen peroxide to monitor glucose level. This is generation one glucose sensor. Here we are using a generation two glucose sensor, basically, Instead of detecting hydrogen peroxide, we introduce a redox mediator, such as proton blue, uh, which can lower the operation voltage of this glucose sensor to around zero volt. Detecting hydrogen peroxide requires high voltage. Uh, if we use only around zero volt, that, that could uh, you know, minimize the influence from many electroactive molecules in our body fluid. So of course, when we design sensor, we want to make sure the sensor have enough sensitivity and linear range. For glucose, the level in human sweat is much lower than blood. That's why we want a higher sensitivity. And for lactate, it's opposite. Uh, sweat concentration is much higher than blood. That's why we want to make sure the sensor has a wide linear range. So that's why we need to tune the sensor design to make sure the sensor has a proper performance to analyzing this target within physiological range in human sweat. And of course, the sensor needs to be very stable. This requires a lot of tricks as well. If you want to detect ions such as uh, sodium, potassium, uh, like uh, calcium, for example, we typically use ion selective electrode. So basically, uh, it's a two electrode uh, design. We have a working electrode, ion, so let's say sodium ion selective electrode or potassium ion selective electrode. We measure the voltage difference between this uh, working electrode and the reference electrode. So on this ion selective electrode, we, we coat the, the electrode with a membrane, ion selective membrane, a key chemical here, you know, it's ionophore. For sodium, we use sodium ionophore X. For potassium, we use uh, volanomycin. This specific ionophore can uh, like uh, basically introduce the selectivity here. Look at the potassium ionophore volanomycin. This molecule has a ring structure. The ring size actually is matched to potassium ion. So on the, electrode put into a, a solution contains potassium, you know, this ion will enter this ring and set the voltage of this working electrode. According to the Nuss equation, the measured voltage difference between the two electrodes uh, can be e expressed like this, measure voltage difference. The voltage difference actually has a log linear relationship with the ion concentration. The slope is 59.16 per, and basically millivolt per decade of concentration. This is for sodium and potassium because Z in this case, charge of ion equal to one, okay? If you want to monitor magnesium on the monitor calcium, the charge of ion equal to two. In this case, our slope of sensitivity will become 29.6 roughly millivolt per decade of concentration. 
Of course, here ion selective electrode, the one uh, uh, important factor is reference electrode. We want to make sure the reference electrode is stable, have stable voltage over time, no matter how you put it, how to uh, you change the external uh, solution or sweat composition, we want to make sure the reference voltage is stable. But you know, if we use a, a classic solid state silver silver chloride electrode, by itself, the silver silver chloride electrode is a chloride selective electrode. That means the voltage will be influenced by the chloride. That's why, to minimize the influence from chloride, we actually coat this silver silver chloride with a polymeric film, which is hydrophobic film, which contains saturated sodium chloride as a buffer film. In this case, no matter how external ion level change, the reference of, uh, of voltage actually remain very stable. In this case, we can get accurate measurement for different type of electrolyte. The third category of sensor we are using basically is a direct uh, voltammetry sensing. Uh, for some molecules, yes, electroactive molecules, these molecules can lose or donate electrons if you apply a certain redox potential. In this case, we can apply you know, square wave voltammetry, differential power voltammetry. Those are very sensitive electrochemical measurement uh, approaches. Uh, they can oxidize the molecule at certain voltage. For example, if you do a DPV scan in human sweat, you see two significant peaks. The first one belongs to uric acid. This is using carbon electrode. Uric acid is metabolized, basically, can be oxidized at around 0.4 volt. The peak height of this, uh, like a uh, current peak height, is cor corresponding to the concentration of this uric acid. In general, if we want to detect some drugs such as caffeine, you know, caffeine can be oxidized at a high voltage at around 1.4 on carbon electrode. The peak height uh, obtained here uh, is uh, has a linear relation with the caffeine concentration. There are actually many uh, electroactive molecules in our body fluid, including many drugs, nutrients and the hormones. In this case, we can detect electroactive molecules uh, using voltammetry scan directly. Of course, there are many, many other molecules in our body fluid. It's not easy to continuously monitor uh, these type of molecules, but people use optimer, people use antibody, we can do rapid detection, but it's still challenging uh, to do in situ continuous monitoring. So to make a wearable biosensor more accessible, uh, to consumers or users, we want to make sure they have high performance and can be mass produced at a low cost. That's why uh, recently we proposed this uh, platform, uh, large scale, low cost manufacturing uh, of this wearable sensor using laser engraving. So laser cutting, you know, especially CO2 laser cutting is well known, is able to introduce Carbonized structure, like graphene structure on the surface of certain uh, substrates, like, such as polyimide. Taking advantage of this, we can patent the graphene based biosensors on the surface of polyimide. In this case, you don't need anything else. You just need the polyimide, you just need the CO2 laser, cut, laser cutting, laser cutter. You now program the laser and you can patent this graphene structure. If you control the parameter um, properly, the graphene structure, uh, actually, the property. Morphology can be tuned by laser cutting parameters. So based on this, we can design high performance graphene uh, with good, very good electrocatalytic activity for high performance chemical sensing. The certain graphene structures uh, can be also used for high performance physical sensing. And we can use the also CO2 laser cutting to make microfluidics. Why we need the microfluidics? Think about that. What we are sampling or detecting sweat. When you have a new sweat come out, they will push away all sweat, right? In this case, uh, you avoid the, the mixing of between new sweat and old sweat. Our sensor can get a high temperature resolution. So in, in this case, we can use the laser cutting. Simply using CO2 laser engraving, we can make a multimodal microfluidic system. They can sample sweat, they can monitor physical parameters such as respiration rate and the heart rate. We can also monitor heart, like electroactive molecules from human sweat. This, um, this disposable sensor patch can entirely be fabricated by laser cutting at a very low cost. So this is very attractive. Think about that. Typically, people do electrochemical sensing. If you want to improve the sensitivity, you need to immobilize nanomaterials. Most of people using drop casting. You immobilize the electrode by one by one. In this case, even the electrode has good performance, you don't have very good reproducibility, right? Using this platform, we can mass produce a sensor at a larger scale and still very high performance. 
So the lead author, uh, Isabella, uh, she actually recently received the uh, 2021 Forbes 30 under 30 because of this work. So this laser engraved graphene electrode is a very good performance compared to classic glass carbon electrode, gold electrode, or screen printed electrode. You see the CV, and if we do direct do the DPV scan from sweat and saliva, we can see significant peaks for uric acid and tyrosine compared to other electrodes. Other electrodes, you don't see clear peaks, but here it's very clear. And that means it's a very good performance for detecting electroactive molecules. The physical sensor designed by the graphene, uh, you know, laser engraved graphene has pretty good performance as well. We can use this for monitor temperature. In this case, you know, when incre the temperature increases, the mobility of this uh, graphene increases and resulting in a decrease in resistance. Basically, graphene-based temperature sensor has a negative temperature coefficient. We can also design the strength sensor when you actually have applied strength, the graphene structure will be bended, right? In this case, the resistance will be changed. Taking advantage of this, we can design respiration or heart rate sensor. But some people might think, since you're engraving or burning polymer to fabricate this 3D graphene structure, this structure may not be very stable. If you bend, the things may fall off, uh, which is not very true. If you control the parameter properly, the graphene structure on polyimide is quite robust. Look at this uh, bottom right figure. We do uh, repetitive bending using robotic arm for 10,000 cycles. The resistance of this graphene structure remain very stable. That means they, they are still quite robust for long-term operation. So this microfluidics engraved by, by this uh, uh, laser can be used to sample sweat pretty efficiently. We mentioned earlier, this is very useful to make sure our sensor has high temperature resolution, make sure the our sensor get time to analyze new sweat. So we had this multi-inlet design. This when sweat come out, it will push all sweat and the ref, refresh is microfluidic uh, reservoir where sensor is located. In this case, we can get a good sensing resolution. This is on the skin. You see how when sweat come out, it push away the black dye uh, very efficiently. In two to three minutes, we can get a full refresh refreshment in the reservoir. And we did a, a microfluidic test. If you look at how we are doing detecting uric acid, for example, if we keep doing repetitive detection for 15 cycles over 15 minutes, the sensor remains very stable performance. Uh, if you change the target the concentration from 20 to 80, you know, it only takes around two minutes to reach the new stable reading. That means the sensor, even there is a delay, it's minimal, it's a few minutes, and we think it's pretty good already for wearable sensing purpose. So our lab, I think we mainly develop systems. We work from material chemistry all the way to collecting data. We, we want to make sure we are not only developing a sensing patch, we want to make sure we can collect a large set of data. That's why we do different type of system integration. We want to make sure uh, the, sy the system can be robust, but, uh, can be comfortable worn by the subject. We can we have this version of the wristband, headband, or banded like a patch. Uh, or we actually recently developed a watch as well. So you can real-time wireless communication and uh, multiplex sensing as well. So in this case, uh, as you can see, uh, this is uh, like my student wear this patch at the wrist and forehead. We can collect data using the cell phone. And some classic curve uh, obtained using, uh, you know, like uh, our wearable sensor during the physical activity, uh, lactate, glucose, sodium, potassium, you know, continuous data collection using our wearable sensor. We also perform uh, sensing validation usually using a gold standard. Uh, this includes ELISA kits, or GCMS or HPLC. We want to make sure our sensor can provide accurate reading to be used for later biomedical applications. So at this moment, uh, some question might come into uh, like a, a mind because we are doing sweat tests, right? Some people may have question, what if I don't have sweat when I do exercise, right? What if for many patients that cannot even do exercise, how this wearable sensor can, wearable sweat sensor can be used still in this case? Right? That's a very good question we have to address uh, before, I mean, we want to make sure our device can be used by as many people as possible. That's why one challenge we, we're trying to address here is how can we access sweat beyond physical exercise? How to make sure this can be used by many patients even while they are sleeping. 
So we learned from the literature that there is a process called antiphoresis. We can use this process for locally induced sweat. So basically, you will apply two hydrogels using a small tool, apply a constant current to deliver the drug molecules below the skin. The drug molecules uh, is usually positively charged. It could be pyrocarbon, could be carbacol, could be metacholine, acetylcholine. They can locally stimulate this sweat gland and trigger the sweating uh, process only from this small area. So in this case, inspired by this, we develop this uh, new platform that can be used for on-demand extract sweat and uh, perform sweat analysis. Basically, the platform can be controlled using a cell phone. If you want to do still sweat simulation, you click a button from a cell phone, a small current will be delivered and uh, stimulate this sweat gland that trigger local sweating process. And during the you know, real sweating process, the sensor will perform continuous analysis. So this process, you know, in high process of sweat analysis, uh, sweat extraction could be a few minutes only. And the sweating process, depending on how you control this process, how you set up this uh, like an anaphoresis procedure or which drug you use, could last from uh, an hour to several days. So we can control this process. And in collaboration with the Stanford School of Medicine, we actually characterize the, uh, the sweating process. If you look at this, uh, if I control the drug types or drug dosage, we actually can control how fast we sweat, how much we sweat, and how long we sweat. So this is very useful for later clinical applications. And uh, as I said, for some of the drug, if we use a few minutes stimulation, can enable hours or even days local sweating. So with this, I want to introduce you some applications of using our wearable sensor for uh, biomedical applications. Firstly, disease diagnosis. One classic application for sweat tests in current clinical setting is cystic fibrosis diagnosis. Cystic fibrosis is a genetic lung disease, and the patients usually have, you know, uh, this genetic disease suffer from like uh, uh, this disease and usually died at a very young age. Clinically, people collect the sweat. See, look, uh, look at this, uh, like baby. People collect the sweat using this device and send out the sweat sample to a laboratory for analysis, which take, could, be take, uh, could take a week to get the data. Um, you know, this is not quite timely and uh, in collaboration with Stanford Cystic Fibrous Center, we applied our sensor to the healthy people and to the patients. Look at this, for the healthy people, within 20, 25 minutes, we can quantify the sweat including basically sweat induction and sensing quantified sweat chloride, sweat sodium. We also can see the patient data from like a, see a patient, uh, like a sodium chloride level. If you compare the statistical level, right now the CF diagnosis is based on sweat chloride higher than 60 millimolar for adults. In this case, uh, we can see that for the healthy people, typically we see it below 30 millimolar. Uh, we can say that our device can be used for screening and diagnosing of CF, basically uh, quite efficiently in this case. Instead of waiting one week, we can do it in 20, 25 minutes. Another application we are looking at actually is the, one of the main focus in our lab is how can we use this wearable sensor to monitor metabolic syndrome? If right now, metabolic syndrome is affecting one third of the population in the United States. The, uh, the risk factor for metabolic syndrome include you know, high blood pressure, high blood pressure, high blood sugar, uh, unhealthy cholesterol level, obesity, and high uric acid level. So wearable sensor can play a very important role to monitor and prevent the development of metabolic syndrome and potentially enable nutritional intervention. So metabolic syndrome is also the risk factor for more severe problems such as type 2 diabetes, kidney disease, and cardiovascular diseases. So the first thing uh, like, uh, people will think about, can you monitor glucose? That's a very good question and a very important topic for all biosensor field people. And we are looking at uh, if we could quantify glucose level through sweat analysis. Uh, we did different type of study. We found that the sweat glucose had a positive correlation with blood glucose level. But in general, the exact correlation is complicated. It's not as high as one could expect for diabetes management. It will require more work, to, uh, more studies to confirm, actually to build a more accurate correlations. It's a complicated one, glucose itself. But we did more work for other metabolites and nutrients. Let's look at one metabolic disorders, gut. 
So God is the most common inflammatory arthritis of affecting tens of millions of people around the world. Uh, the well-known biomarker of a gout is uric acid. Uh, in general, gout is characterized by chronic hyperuricemia. And for in upper limit, for normal range, it's 360 micromolar per liter for women and 400 micromolar per liter for men. So monitor uric acid level is very important. Uh, firstly, you know, for the healthy people, you can minimize the chance for developing gout because uh, uh, although, you know, gout is mostly because of a genetic reason, but still a large portion of people, it's because of a lifestyle, people develop gout. So for the gout patient, if the morning uric acid level, it's very hard for them to control their dietary intake to avoid a gout attack. Because, you know, if most people, uh, if people are like a meat lover, or people like the seafood or beer, uh, it will very easy to get a gut attack for a gut patient. You know, even they will still want to eat this type of food a lot, but the gut attack is quite painful because the uric acid crystallizes near the joint and the, uh, will trigger a, a lot of pain. That's why it's minimized chance for them if they could monitor uric acid level for the gut attack. And for the people on medication, you know, um, uh, gut patient many are on medication using, let's say, allopurinol to lower the uric acid level. This could help them to personalize the dose of the drug because if you take too much or too less, the drug is both not good. But uh, having this real-time feedback is also very good for drug personalization. That's why using our laser engraved microfluidic sensor patch, we can quantify uh, this uric acid level in human sweat and we can compare sweat reading with uh, blood uric acid levels. From a male subject, from a male, female subject, you see that uh, during the fasting period and after pure and rich food intake, we see sweat serum uric acid level both increased compared to fasting stage. And uh, if we, we actually recruited the patient with gut, subject with hyperuricemia and healthy subjects, we actually compared, you see, like for the patient's uh, sweat and serum data, both are much higher compared to healthy people. And from here, uh, we track one subject over seven hour for both sweat and serum. We found that sweat follow closely to a serum uric acid level. And if we plot the correlation together, you see we get a correlation factor of around 0.6864. It's pretty high already, we think, because this is without a interpersonal calibration. So in general correlation, right now we are uh, working closely with our clinical collaborator, Dr. Uh, Chang Sai and Dr. Zhaoping Li. Dr. Li is actually the chief of the clinical nutrition at the UCLA Medical Center to monitor circulating metabolic nutrients, many others in our uh, skin using our wearable sweat sensor. So another application I want to share with you, I mentioned already even for gout, for, I mean, medication. Medication is an uh, uh, important thing to monitor. Uh, therapeutic drug monitoring is very important for many uh, you know, disease management. Drug dose uh, is critical. And in precision medicine, of course, we, we hope the physician can, can, can tailor the medication according to each person's response because everybody responds different to each drug. Even take the same amount of drug, you, as you can imagine, the drug metabolism will vary a lot if you compare a healthy people, I mean, uh, adult people with a with a, with a child. If you compare obesity people with the very same people, things may vary a lot. But right now, you know, many medications, when you take one pill, take two pill, you know, there is no uh, personalized dosing here. Uh, in fact, many drugs have very narrow therapeutic window. What is therapeutic window? If you dose a drug level too high, you will suffer from strong side effect. If you don't dose enough drug below this therapeutic window, you don't get enough treatment. That means you need to control the drug uh, carefully, not too high, not too low, within this green zone, then you get enough treatment and don't get uh, like a too much uh, negative effect from the drug or from the disease in general. But uh, that's why there are a lot of people working on pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics. Right now, TDM uh, is mainly based on blood collection and followed by mass spectrum analysis. As you can imagine, for many people, it's not very convenient for, for them to come to a clinic uh, many times do the blood draw and to look at the drug metabolism level and uh, then wait a week to look at this moment is drug concentration because we need to wait for, uh, for the laboratory results, right? Which is not very practical, especially for many rare diseases. 
That's why if we could think about our wearable biosensor, the skin interface, the wearable sensor, if we could quantify drug on the skin, this would be very useful. And the, before we found a, a great a clinic collaborator, we think about what we can do in our lab. So we started with a simple model drug, caffeine. Caffeine is a drug, and we are taking caffeine every day because we drink coffee. Coffee is a simple way of, like a, for this, like a dosing, right? That's why it's easy for us to do this human study, just ask our subject to drink coffee, one shot, two shots, three shots. We can control the dose in this case. And we can detect the caffeine using uh, like a differential positive time. As I said, caffeine is an electroactive molecule that I mentioned earlier. If we use the carbon negative electrode, we can detect caffeine at around 1.4 volt. The oxidation peak height has a linear relationship with the caffeine concentration. And we develop this system based on printed electrode, based on multi wall carbon tubes. And we use the uh, 0.01% napping uh, coating to miniaturize the falling to make sure we can, the sensor can still last long and still have good performance. And we actually found that uh, we, we can see caffeine ch level change after the drink coffee from our sensor. You can see the caffeine increase in the first hour then start to decrease. And basically we can start the entire metabolic process of caffeine using our wearable sensor. And imagine th if this is a therapeutic drug, we could also do the same. The physician could monitor the drug level remotely from the patient. We actually have a close collaboration with City of Hope. We are working on a number of different types of cancer drugs right now. We actually have recruited over 50 patients here. So actually, one, one story I want to share is we found that uh, some people may argue here, you know, what if, uh, why not use saliva? Uh, why use sweat, right? Like a saliva, we found from this collaboration that in many patients, it's hard for them to provide saliva. Of course, saliva can also be easily influenced by the food intake or drug intake, right, by itself. But many people, the mouth is very dry, it's hard to provide saliva. But doing sweat tests is very convenient. For many cancer patients, they are, like, uh, for, uh, they usually sleep um, uh, um, most of the time, for example. We can still do sweat extraction and sensing on them while they are sleeping, of course, with their consent, as you can imagine. This is very convenient, uh, very attractive. So uh, one more application I want to share with you is using this wearable sensor for stress and mental health monitoring. As you know, stress, 95% of the disease is stress related. So it's including anxiety, depression, PTSD, cardiovascular disease and cancers. So only major depressive disorder is affecting 260 million, over 260 million around the world. P PTSD affecting 69% in the United States already. So it's a huge population. Um, but how like stress or mental disorders monitor questionnaires? So people, subject get asked a bunch of questions. Based on the answer, a score will be provided. As you can imagine, this is a subjective process, subjective process. And a similar, similar thing is to how people monitor pain. Uh, you ask people how painful you feel from at a scale of zero to 10, as you can imagine, this answer could be very subjective. So for depression, the same. There is a PHQ-9 to monitor, like uh, to actually provide the, the depression score. So we were thinking, can we build a biosensor that can quantify stress or mental disorders? People are looking at using blood pressure, look at using heart rate. As you can imagine, this could be useful, but not very condition specific. Many things could cause these changes, right? We are looking at any particular biomarkers. Of course, one of the most well-known stress biomarker would be stress hormone. Uh, the most uh, hormones, actually, most, the most well-known stress hormone will be cortisol. People are looking at cortisol a lot extensively. And we could collect blood to monitor the cortisol level. This is what people use even for a lot of animal tests. They collect the mice blood to monitor stress of the mind. But one question come out here. If we collect blood to monitor stress, the blood collection, blood, you know, finger pricks or blood draw itself is a stress inducing event. In this case, you give subject more stress to monitor the stress. By itself, it's problematic as you can imagine. That's why non-invasive stress quantification or stress hormone analysis will be very attractive. So we propose here using a telemedicine platform, we can sample sweat. We quantify the cortisol through sweat analysis. So we still use our laser engraved graphene platform. 
we use a, this is not really a wearable continuous monitoring platform. Instead, it's more like a point of care uh, rapid test system. We can, using this antibody mobilized electrode with the competitive assay strategy, we can quantify the stress hormone cortisol level in one minute, basically. Uh, basically, you see like one minute incubation give us around 60% like a, 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 a competition already. So actually our measurement time take only seven to 10 seconds. So total is one half, within one and a half minutes, we can get one measurement for stress hormone. So we actually validated our sensor like uh, in sweat and in saliva, um, you need the gold standard like ELISA kit. We found that our sensor can provide pretty accurate reading. So if we apply our sensor on human studies, we found that we can see the circadian rhythm of the stress hormone cortisol. In the AM, PM, you see serum, saliva, sweat, you very similar pattern. Morning cortisol level higher than PM. I forgot to mention before, cortisol level is very important for morning stress, but not only the level cortisol, we need to look at uh, the pattern of cortisol. Uh, you know, our cortisol in the body follow a circadian rhythm. In the morning, we have high cortisol level. In the afternoon or evening, the cortisol level is very low. And uh, day by day is like this. The pattern of cortisol over the entire day is very important. For patients with uh, depression, PTSD, or even patients with diabetes, their circadian pattern of cortisol is different from healthy people. So that's why we want to look at the pattern as well as the level. So we actually uh, identified the skin rhythm from the healthy people, even from the skin, human sweat over a six step period. You see every day, the morning cortisol level in, uh, in sweat is higher than evening or afternoon. And we obtained a high correlation uh, factor of uh, around 0.87 here between sweat and serum cortisol. Very high correlation. That means we could use sweat as a source of cortisol, um, for cortisol monitoring towards stress or mental health assessment. So to make sure our device can be used to dynamically access the stress hormone level, to assess the stress hormone level, we designed two human trials also. Here, first one, we apply uh, one stressor, the physical stress aerobic exercise. So in this case, we ask the subject to have vigorous exercise. Vigorous exercise is a very good stressor and the subject will get uh, a lot of stress and their cortisol level increase in the body. And uh, we monitor sweat cortisol level here. You see increases during the entire biking period and reach the peak at the 40 minutes. After they stop the biking, we see the cortisol level decreases. And of course, we see an exception before, uh, subject four is actually the athlete. For athletes, their cortisol level reco recover faster than like uh, untrained people. So this is also acceptable because you know they get used to this vigorous exercise and they have very good recovery mechanism. So this is uh, using vigorous exercise as stressor. What if other stressors? Exercise induced sweat, right? Uh, how about other time, like uh, during the daily activity, how do I monitor my stress level? As we mentioned, we have this platform to monitor, to access sweat through anaphoresis, right? That we designed another study. Uh, we applied cold pressure test as a stressor to monitor like uh, the stress hormone level. In this case, how this process work? You need to put your hand into ice water. Guess okay, so what you will feel? Pain, it's quite painful. That's why it's called the pressure test used as a pain test. If you put your hand in ice water, it gives you a lot of stress. So actually, I was the first subject in my group to do this study. Uh, at the time, I feel quite painful. I want to look at uh, like a, uh, like basically I noticed at that time, all my lab members are looking at me, staring at me, making me even feel more stressful. Uh, then I realized later on why they do this because you know everyone they put a dollar they just bet how long my hand can stay inside is ice water. So it was a quite fun experience and uh, we actually see uh, the stress hormone level increase from all subjects who do cold pressure tests and we can using our sensor to access this dynamic cortisol level uh, during and after this cold pressure test. This is another test. Right now we are doing partnership with. Uh, NASA with Navy to apply, you know, our general wearable sensor along with this course analysis for monitor the health of astronauts and war fighters. Uh, I think it's a very attractive approach for human performance monitoring overall. So this slide is not about uh, 
a sweat sensor, but I want to put it here because it's a similar uh, sensing mechanism. I showed our lazy engraved platform for monitor circulating metabolites and nutrients for monitor stress hormones. Uh, even until now, we are still suffering from, you know, this COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, last year, we were thinking about what we can do to, to contribute to fighting COVID-19 infection. Rapid test, because we are doing biosensors. So we developed this rapid test system, SARS-CoV-2 RapidPlex. We call it RapidPlex. You can simultaneously monitor different type of biomarkers in our blood and the saliva, including virus antigen, which tell us information about whether we are currently infected or not. We, this system could also monitor virus antibodies, which could tell us our immunity inf information, uh, whether we get infected before or how our vaccine status is. This could also monitor the inflammatory biomarker level, tell us how severe the infection is. So overall, we have these four sensors together that working simultaneously that could tell us all these three aspects of information current infection, immunity, and severity. So uh, the entire system, uh, as you can see, is it can be mass produced in the laser engraving at low cost. And uh, we developed this wireless system. You can use this for at home rapid COVID test. And we actually uh, validated our system uh, selectivity over SARS and MERS. And we did a test in COVID positive sample and COVID negative sample. We found that we can distinguish all the positive sample from negative sample we have, basically. So you see for uh, M protein, S, uh, S1 IgG, S1 IgM, and CRP, all the level we collected from both blood and uh, saliva are higher than the healthy samples. And uh, we actually looking at uh, the uh, inflammatory bi biomarker level versus the severity of this uh, uh, symptom basically we found that you know with the increase of symptom we ob ob we do observe the uh observe this increase the crp level indicating that we can actually access the severity here okay last part of my today's talk i want to you know, briefly talk about uh, how we can power the future wearables so we are talking about our wearable sweat sensor we can do a lot of things we can incorporate more and more sensors but this will put a higher requirement about the power supplies Right now, most of the wearables are powered by lithium battery. We also use a lithium battery. One lithium battery could be used for a day. And, uh, but electricity is not everywhere available. What if we don't have place to charge our battery? Uh, especially if you think about the warfighters performing the task in the wild, they don't have electricity to charge. Right? How can we like power the sensors continuously? And for future wearable, we think one attractive strategy is how we can harvest energy from environment or from our body. In this case, you know, we can sustainably power our system. And uh, one of the, because we are doing sweat sensor, one thing coming to our mind, can we really like, uh, Basically, since we are doing sweat tests, can we use sweat as a source to power our system? As you know, uh, our sweat contains many chemicals. Biofuel cell, this concept, actually harvest energy, could harvest energy from body chemicals. In this case, we could use sweat lactic acid as a power source. We can harvest energy from sweat lactate, and then we can power the entire system. So in this case, we recently we developed a biofuel powered electronic skin we can harvest energy from human sweat at a very high efficiency. We're getting enough power that we can use this power from human sweat, power to power multiple biosensors, to power the electronic circuitry, and to power Bluetooth wireless communication without the need of any battery. So how can we achieve that? You know, typical biofuel cells suffer from the low power density and poor stability issue. We actually address this problem by using nanomaterial innovations. In this case, by we have two electric arrays. Bioanode is an enzymatic anode with lactic oxides to really uh, convert the lactate to uh, uh, for the lactate convert the catalyst, uh, catalyze this lactic oxidation to get electricity, right? But on the anode side, we actually uh, using a 3D nickel structure. We coat nickel structure with graphene oxides, and we then coat the graphene oxide surface with a carbonyl tube network. We actually enhanced the surface area by 3,000 times. In this case, we can get a very high power. For the cathode side, uh, we use the platinum cobalt alloy nanoparticle doped carbonyl tube network. 
which also give us very high uh, service activity, as well as later on we talk about the stability improvement. Overall, we get such very high power, uh, like a, from human sweat. It's by far the best from this uh, untreated human body fluid, as you can see here. We can get up to 3.6 milliwatt per centimeter square. Very small area, we can continuously get over three milliwatt. And even for other like a lower level, we can still get around two milliwatt. For some people, they have lower lactic acid level. We can still get two milliwatt per centimeter square. As you can imagine, if you increase the surface area, you can get high power. And this is a continuous power. For this platinum cobalt nanoparticle decorated as common tube, uh, they show very good stability. Because if you typically only use platinum, and uh, as a catalyst, people use platinum, and platinum can be easily uh, like a poisoned by body fluid, uh, which is, that's why they are not very stable. If you use silver silver chloride as the cathode, they are consumable. That's why they cannot last long either. So by using this platinum cobalt nanoparticle, this allow us to really uh, like uh, these biofuels that work at a prolonged period. The reason is that this cobalt dopant. Dopant actually can enhance the cohesive energy uh, and enhance the stability of the particle. So in this case, we get much better performance in body fluid. You see in sweat, if you only use plasma, the onset potential decreases quickly within one hour. If you use plasma cobalt, it decreases very slow. And if we on the top of plasma cobalt coat a nephin film for anti-falling, we can get a stable performance over a very long period of time, like here, 15 hour operation, uh, if we store this by itself for another 24 hour, we can uh, we use another 15 hour. You see, the onset potential remain nearly unchanged. They are very stable, and we did a very interesting power management. We want to make sure even our sweat contain very low lactic acid level. For some cases, we can still get enough power to power entire system. So we can put the entire system to sleep. When we get enough power, we, we wake our system, do a quick measurement on virus communication. So basically, every several seconds, we can get a measurement. Uh, using this system. You see deep sleep for a few seconds and wake up for a very short period, do the measurement. So we impact the entire system into a soft electronic skin and it's, it's flexible. As you can see here, we can wear this at different body parts for like a, a continuous operation. And we do the charging, discharging. We have a small capacitor. We can charge this capacitor using our uh, like harvest and harvest the energy from the biofuel. Uh, charging discharging for the first 20 hour, you see up to 50 hour, uh, still this, the performance is the same. We can, uh, this system can continue to work. And if we use sweat even for 24 hours, you see, they can still have very stable performance. Even sweat contains almost a minimal uh, concentration already, five minimal lactic acid level, and the system can still work very well. As again, the entire system is better free. And we can, using this battery-free system to monitor our metabolites and nutrients, including here, urea, ammonia, glucose, and of course we can all monitor pH as well. So uh, this is a battery-free system. And very recently, we, in collaboration with the professor Azita Imami, uh, electrical engineering professor at Caltech uh, with the expertise of IC design, we designed this IC chip, uh, energy harvesting chip, the size is only one millimeter by 1.3 millimeter, very small. Uh, even we package the entire system together with the biofuel cell, the size is only 5.5, 6.2. This can perform, you know, uh, energy harvesting, processing, and the stable power output. So we can use this system to power our future wearables. As you can imagine, we can design really miniaturized system that can efficiently harvest the power and that can be used to power future next generation wearable sensor. So the last slide on the research is uh, we could also use uh, energy harvesting uh, uh, from our body motion to power our wearable sensor. In this case, we can use uh, like a flexible, freestanding triple electro nano generator. So we design our system using uh, like a, a, a flexible printed circuit board. So basically this uh, in, um, nano generator system can be mass produced uh, using industry level PCB manufacturing. As you, can, as you can imagine, this is quite robust as well instead of a laboratory setting, doing different type of coating. This is a commercial PCB uh, manufacturing process, mass producible and very robust. 
And we can uh, harvest energy from our body motion, from different type of physical activity, as, as you can imagine. And uh, we can store the power in a small capacitor. And when we, uh, so the capacitor get charged with a certain voltage, we can power also the multi-bio sensors and the wireless communication without using a battery. So overall, biofuel cell power and body motion power allow us to really harvest our energy continuously from our body without using um, battery even. Or we could use a small battery and eventually these energy harvesters could charge a battery for more sustainable uh, like uh, operation, right? To summarize, I propose this wearable sensing platform allow us to monitor a broad spectrum biomarker in human skin. And uh, we could use this data collected from sensor for fitness tracking, for disease diagnosis, for general health monitoring, and very importantly, the large set of data collected from these wearable chemical sensors could be used for numerous clinical and uh, like uh, fundamental investigations, especially toward preventive care. So in the end, I would like to thank my team at Caltech and uh, for their hard work and our collaborators and uh, of course our clinical collaborators at different medical centers. And of course, lastly, also very importantly, our funding support from many different type of funding agents. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, I'll be happy to take any question you might have. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the fantastic talk, Wei. I uh, appreciate it. A uh, couple of questions came in uh, for Prussian, Prussian below. Is there any better alternative to PB, PB for glucose sensing in what aspect? Yes, there, uh, uh, in case of the redox mediators, there are many different type of redox mediator. And uh, we choose Prussian blue because Prussian blue has lowest operation voltage. Uh, based on our setup, we just need to apply zero volt or just like a tens of millivolts. Uh, there is other foreigners, many other redox potential there at around 0 0.2, 0 0.3 volt. Uh, we have many options. This could work as well, I think. Yeah, can be used for glucose sensing. But uh, they, um, but think about that. If you use a if 0.3 or higher, there is uric acid operation is at that voltage. You may get in, in, in interference using high voltage, uh, like from this uric acid when you apply this voltage. Yeah. Thanks. Um, one, uh, one person was wondering, what would be the challenge and the requirement of detected inputs to translate the microbial sensors into practical wearable sensors? How to get real-time correlation of target molecule levels, drug levels between sweat and blood? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, so uh, this type of like uh, onboarding evaluation is uh, part of our job. So like uh, we have like a 10 IRB protocols at uh, our lab at Caltech. We have five IRBs at different medical centers, including UCLA, USC, Citizen, and the City of Hope. So we actually uh, collect data. And firstly, I mean, uh, our initial, we usually collect sweat compared with the blood. Of course, this is not the best way. And then we use our wearable sensor continuously collect data from skin. We, then we compare the blood draw data using finger prick or binet blood draw, uh, analyzing in the lab. Then we can look at the potential delay of this, uh, like a sweat, uh, like a sensor reading. That's uh, how we study the correlation here. Yeah. Thank you. A uh, quick question. Uh, what is the purpose of the P dot layer in the ion selective sensors? Oh, the P dot layer is, uh, is very, uh, like, it's very important to, for, uh, P dot layer is the ion uh, charge transducer because uh, one of the reasons for ion selective electrode uh, has poor performance over a long period of time, because, you know, if we typically use gold and a polymeric film, the water will slowly penetrate below the polymer film and uh, cause the sensor potential drift. We use this p it, it act as an ion charge transducer, and we will also enhance the adhesion between the polymeric ion selective film and the gold film. With this p film, we get a much higher in kind of stability with minimal uh, like a voltage drift over time for ion selective sensors. Yeah. Great. Uh, you use the oxidation reduction of the analyte in sweat. How specific can this sensor be? Anything exists in this oxidation reduction will interfere. He didn't see any specificity for the analyte detection. Also, ions are different from person to person. How can you compensate for them? Yeah, that's a, uh, of course, that's a very good question. Uh, for the selectivity, selectivity is by itself, it could be an issue if you want to detect the low concentration in the range. That's why we started with a fairly high concentration range. Let's say uh, there are a number of electroactive molecules, uh, like uh, in human cells, like at a point four, we, we found that the uric acid is a dominant one. So, so specificity is uh, like a, basically can be improved by choosing the proper voltage. You use different material, 
uh, even for the molecule at a similar voltage, they can be separated. And uh, at this voltage, you may only have one or few molecules can be oxidized uh, at a, a significant level because you know different concentration, they also play an important role. That's why we started with the uric acid and tyrosine. Take one example, tyrosine is the uh, oxidation peak is 0.7. And if we look at neuron peptide, uh, it ox oxidation peak could be also 0.7. But neuron peptides is present at like a million times or even more lower than tyrosine level. That's why we detect the tyrosine. But if we want to detect the much lower version, we need a, another interesting uh, like a strategy. We actually uh, develop the, the part that, like uh, right now, we hope to be, share, be able to share that approach soon. But in general, as I said, right now the approach is look at the voltage, separate the peaks and also like uh, like uh, by electro design, improve the sensitivity and for peak separation. Look at the specific voltage. Uh, yeah, we can distinguish many molecules, but not all. Yeah. Um, thank you. Well, um, would sweat from arm and other places such as face different in composition? Uh, I'm sorry. Can, can you say? Uh, you, you're saying the sweat you obtain from your face versus your arm. Oh yeah. It's different. That's another very good question. So we actually studied uh, the different body parts. Uh, the body, uh, different body parts indeed have uh, like a composition variation. Uh, this, like, uh, this is uh, you know we think it is more influenced by sweat rate. Uh, in case of like, uh, it's a come to another question. Uh, if we sweat more, sweat less. Some biomarker level in human sweat will, will be influenced. I mean, many biomarker level will not influence by sweat rate, but many will. So when we have a different body parts, think about my arm may sweat less, my forehead may sweat more, the sweat rate may be different. That's why for some biomarkers, uh, people actually try to incorporate, we also uh, like in sweat rate sensor for potential calibration. In this case, the uh, regional variation would be uh, could be calibrated potentially, and you know we can get a more consistent data in a correlation study. Of course, when we do the current, uh, current correlation study, we always do from the arm to make sure same location correlated to blood. Yeah. I see. Thank you. Is there a reason to choose PSS over conductive carbon particle nanoparticles? Uh, I think, as I said, PSS by itself is polymer. And it, uh, people use uh, like conducting carbon as an electrode. Uh, the, the conduct, this carbon is equivalent to our gold electrode. To improve the adhesion between this carbon uh, to the ion selective membrane, this polymer uh, like uh, is it, still needed, I think, even if you use carbon electrode, it will enhance the performance of this ion selective sensor. Yeah. Okay. For cortisol sensing, normally antibodies need time to bind to their analyte. How can you make sure you detect cortisol binding, not the effect of salt on the electrochemical sensors? Uh, as I said, for the cortisol sensor, we are not doing really wearable continuous monitoring. So it is an immuno assay based on anybody. Based on, it is a competitive assay based on anybody. Uh, in this case, we actually do detection in a solution of hydrogen peroxide. We do one minute incubation in sweat. Uh, it could be on the skin incubation, then peel it off do a seven to 10 me second measurement in hydrogen peroxide. This is how we do right now. Of course, our goal is really do everything on the skin continuously. And uh, we are working on that as well. Yeah. One guy says our skin can st stretch as well, but you always talk about flexible substrate. Mm -hmm. How do you see the future of stretchable substrates? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, stretchability is an important direction. Many people work on stretchable electronics. Uh, we think it's not a, uh, mostly needed in the wearable chemical sensor field because think about that, our skin firstly doesn't really stretch that much. And the other thing, we our sensor is not directly on the uh, attached on the sensor. We actually using a skin adhesive, let's say it could be a 3M adhesive, like a bandage. You wear a bandage on the skin and the sensor is in, in the reservoir, in the microfluidic reservoir. When we have sweat into the microfluidics and the sensor will perform continuous measurement. That's why even the skin stretch a little bit, the sensor will still facing, like, it's not really attached with the skin, will not have influenced by this um, like small stretchability. But uh, of course, uh, that's an important feature people are trying to develop as well. We just think about, uh, if we think about it, we, we wear a bandage, uh, our sensor is really like a bandage, you know, like uh, we can, I think it's sufficient to sample sweat and analyzing sweat uh, uh, like accurately and with minimal influence from the body deformation and uh, like a body motion in general. Yeah, I, I do agree. Like this would be interesting and many people are working to develop flex stretchable electronics. It's just uh, 
not the highest priority for biosensing, we think, because there are more unmet challenges to address in the biosensing side. Yeah. Thank you. With such variability in human bodies and the environments they occupy, what processes does your team use to help calibrate results for accuracy? Uh, uh, can you repeat the first uh, Sorry. Harry. Sure. Uh, human bodies are variable and the environments they live also are variable. What process do you use to calibrate uh, your results for accuracy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's another very good question. So uh, for the sensor, there are two parts of calibration. One thing is the sensor operation calibration. The other is the interpersonal, like personalized calibration, right? So firstly, for sensor calibration, if we do on the skin monitoring, we want to make sure, you know, for example, glucose sensor, some glucose sensor could be influenced by the temperature, by the pH. That's why we have this temperature sensor, let's say for real-time sensor calibration to make sure the sensor can monitor accurately. This is about the sensors, make sure sensor can give accurate measurement. Another thing is about the person. So uh, like as the question mentioned, the person can be influenced by different, like a thing. I, I, every person can behave differently, right? Electrolyte calibration, that's potentially another thing. And uh, for the correlation right now, we didn't do like a personalized calibration. Let's say I, the way I showed the cortisol and uric acid, we, we hope we can build a universal calibration. We put all the data together, we obtain a high correlation factor. If we could bring one person data together, we hope, we think the correlation could be even higher. We think that's another thing that need to be done, I think. Uh, of course, we, we hope to build a generalized correlation, but inter I mean, personalized calibration will be, uh, a plus, I would say, based on that, it would be very important for if we directly want to use eventually uh, for personal health care in a real life setting, right? Yeah. Thank you. In general, iontophoresis requires the target molecule to be charged. However, cortisol is neutral. What is the method of detection here in case of reduced sweat condition? So, uh, yeah. Anaphoresis, uh, anaphoresis and reverse anaphoresis here is a different process. And people use reverse anaphoresis to extract uh, uh, ISF molecule, interstitial fluid molecules. When you apply this, this uh, current, the charged molecules will go out of the skin to enter the hydrogel to do ISF analysis. But for sweat, it's different. So we, we use anaphoresis only to deliver the charged drug molecule below the skin. And we only apply a few minutes. So you, let's say you apply five minutes, the drug molecules get delivered to below the skin already, then you don't apply current anymore. So the drug will continuously stimulate sweat gland that trigger sweating. So then the entire sweating process is like our normal sweating process. So sweat continues to come out without any involvement of anaphoresis anymore. Yeah. See. Is it possible to use chemi resistors instead of some of the three electrode electrochemical systems? Yeah, for chemical resistors, I think we use that for detecting like a more like a respiration or heart rate for resistive based sensors. But for only resistors, it's hard for us to um, ensure the selectivity. That's why the uh, classic electrochemical setup is very good in this to make sure we can detect target selectively and accurately. Of course, people are also using like other type of design like transistors, which potentially could be used for sweat analysis as well. I think, but only a resistive sensor is we think it's pretty hard to ensure high selectivity. Thank you. Do you think it's possible to integrate wearable sensors into subcutaneous controlled drug delivery systems? Yes, yes, that's something very, very interesting. I, I, believe, I believe so. <clears throat> we can put a skin interface sensor to monitor, <clears throat> to monitor biomarker level and to control the drug delivery system. Yeah, I, I think uh, that would be a very interesting idea and topic, yeah. Can body heat be harnessed to power the sensors? Uh, yes, I think so. Uh, that would be a very interesting topic as well. But right now, based on our literature review, we found that like, uh, body, people have body heat, but right now the power we get is not sufficient. Of course, if there is a technology innovation allow us to harvest the body heat at a high efficiency and we can get a good amount of power, this will be very attractive as well, I think. Thank you. Uh, I wonder what sort of graphene materials have been used. Can other 2D materials be used for your wearable sensor devices? Uh, I believe so. I think people use uh, like a monosulfide for like a biosensing. And recently, people see use maxing, you know, for, for sweat sensing. And I think this 2D material uh, will be attractive for certain type of target analysis, uh, including different forms of the graphene. We use laser engraved graphene just because we think that this 
easily mass producible at a large scale and allow us to, we don't have to consider too much about the sensor sensor variation in this case. Otherwise, we, it's hard to do make large scale sensor electro, you know, at, with uniform performance. They may still have individual good performance. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting um, direction to explore mass production of other 2D material based electric chemical sensors. Yeah. Thank you so much. There's another one. Do you think it is possible to integrate your uh, COVID-19 biosensor in a face mask to detect COVID-19 from breath? Um, it, that's interesting, but it's hard for our current setup to do that way because firstly, our sensor is mainly do detecting in the liquid. So it uh, require uh, there is a water film uh, to do the detection. And right now our signal transduction is by some peroxide. Right now it's hard to put in a mask. But I think there is some other interesting approach can be used for mask design, probably not our <laughs> methodology in this case. Well, that's all the questions I have. Thank you for your time and for this fantastic talk, Way. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thanks everyone for attending my talk. Thank you. Take care, thanks.